when one receives a complicated gadget, one needs to read carefully the instructions. The maker created a very complicated gadget, the cosmos, and in it one particularly complex in the midst, the soul and body of man. This bit, at least the soul bit, would not disintegrate, but once made would continue to be for all eternity. And so need was there for its care, and only an idiot will presume to go through eternity without reading the instructions for use. If not, it's like a soldier going to war without any instruction at all. He's bound to mess it up. So too, eternity is easily messed up when no reference is made to the instructions for use. And so it is that the Decalogue was given by the finger of God on a holy mount. After a long period of waiting, 40 days and 40 nights. Of course we know better, don't we? We can vote in anything we can, can't we? But the Creator has written it twice over. C.S. Lewis, in his little volume, Mere Christianity, argues for the existence of God from the moral law. He sees, just from observing, that every human being has something writ large inside him and somehow knows what is what. There is a chemical reaction when he goes against it. So, the Creator is also the great writer of this law, twice over. Once on the tablets, and once on the tablets of the human heart. And if the human heart chooses to disobey, then it feels a difficult world developing inside it. It has to usually flee that world. It is not at peace and it has therefore to numb the voice inside. Initially it's difficult, but then it becomes more easy and the consequences become more grave. When talking to a soul, one has to try to let that soul hear again that voice. One cannot presume that the soul actually is of bad will, but the soul is attracted always by a form of good. The only thing is that it takes that as the absolute good in its case, out of context and eventually out of control. There is no peace outside the will of God. And actually, in the discernment of vocations and of life choices, it's this that one looks for as the divine signature. Is there a deep peace? And also, it applies to our cult. For we notice that a part of the Decalogue is linked with our relationship with God and our worship. One cannot just have ritual. Worship is on the level of the will. And therefore, if the will is not handed over, there is no relationship. It is interesting 
to note that in the shorter form of this Sunday's reading from the book of Exodus, one is allowed to omit certain passages. And one of the passages that one can omit is, interestingly enough, the reference to the Sabbath day. We do that easily, do we not? We think this perhaps had something to do with the Hebrews only. The maker wanted this part of the instructions included in the package. In the period of the French Revolution, they imposed a ten-day week, and psychologically it didn't work. We need one-seventh for God, and in God we also heal ourselves. It is tragic that man can jump over life into eternity with not even a seventh in control. And if in our assemblies, even there, we're not at rest, what a disaster has become our Christian life. So we have to do with wisdom, that wisdom of which St. Paul speaks as he begins to address the Corinthians who have many problems. Corinth, being a very Greek city, was full of its own problems. And by osmosis, they creep into the community. But the Greeks would look at the cross as a scandal. They want wisdom. And God's wisdom is folly for man. And is that not a little familiar? How the mainstream media are grown up, and only the backward need religion. The modern man is self-sufficient. Wisdom. In the Easter liturgy, before the Gospel, the people are invited to stand up. Ortho Sophia. Stand up. Wisdom. Upright. And the sign of the cross is made, while that is chanted. And it's an invitation to be aware that we're listening to the Logos, the one who gave us the instructions for use, the one also who potentially leads the way into the beyond. But only he safely leads. If we try to get there without him, or if we think we can, we may find that we've made a huge blunder. But it'll be too late. With regard to the house of God, the Lord burned with zeal for it, and he couldn't bear, not in itself, the desire to have only pure money used in the temple, not contaminated with pagan symbols or emperor's faces, nor again not to have the possibility of offering clean, whole animals without defect. But putting all this in the holy area of the house of God was a different question. And that has happened also to us, if we're honest. How much non-God happens in the place of God, even in the liturgy itself? How much raucous laughter is produced in the house of God, in the course of the liturgy itself. How much unnecessary profane words come in at the last point, even before the post-communion prayer quite often. The bulletin normally is sufficient to give the essence of the news. Unfortunately, one gets the impression sometimes that the culminating point is this announcing of events. 
still it's the getting of the people together so as to inform them what is happening happening in the course of the week whereas actually the happening is happening right there at the altar the Lord if he were with us would say again take these things out of here my house should be called a house of prayer all kinds of things walk in and out of church huge Christmas trees more of the same thing let us get back to actually what the Spirit was trying to say to the churches of the Second Vatican Council. With regard to the liturgy, it had to be pruned so as to see again the great lines of the architecture. Fortunately, we have yet again a new overgrowth and we can't see the great lines of the architecture. Indeed, the overgrowth is so much that the Lamb of God is the last thing thought about on his altar.